I invite you to bow your heads with me and, and let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that we can gather together. We're free to do so in this place of worship. We ask that your Holy Spirit will be present. We pray that you will clear our mind of clutter. We pray that you will remove the things that have been occupying us throughout this week. And we ask that just for these next few moments, you will speak to each of us individually. We pray that your word will have its way. And we ask that our hearts will be fertile ground to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So in 1984, um, In 1984, the first transatlantic flight was made in a hot air balloon. In 1984, Ronald Reagan was president. In 1984, the Macintosh computer was first released. And in 1984, I was busy at work and Richard is looking at me like what work were you doing in 1984 the work I was doing was the work of growing in my mother's belly and in 1984 the film Ghostbusters was released and I see nods of people who have seen Ghostbusters If you haven't seen it, you don't really need to see it, but Ghostbusters was a comedy that followed the lives of three eccentric parapsychologists that worked in New York City. So these three men worked at Columbia University and they got in some trouble and they were fired from their job. And so they set up in an abandoned firehouse a ghost-catching service. They went around New York City going to haunted apartments, going to people who called them and catching ghouls that were up to no good. The story has its ebbs and its flows. There is a, you know, there is a storyline, there's a romantic interest because there always is. And at the end, the ghost busters go up against uh, the ghost goza. It was 1984. I guess that was the best name they could come up with for a ghost who was the head of all the other ghosts, goza. And the three come together and they join their ghost catching powers together and they are able to rid New York City of this ghost and then become the heroes. Now, I'm sure if in 1984 you had gone to the people who had gone to see this film and you had interviewed them and said, so based on this film you have just seen, will you be going to the Yellow Pages and finding your nearest parapsychologist to help cast or to catch some ghosts. What do you think they would have said? Um, Maybe they might have laughed because they thought the film is still going and this is a joke. And then if you persisted and said, no, really, are you going to get the services of a parapsychologist to help you with some ghosts? Once they realized you were serious, they would probably look at you with total incredulity and shock. Because the other realm and the supernatural is just the stuff of Hollywood. No one in their right mind in 1984 or even in 2015 would believe in the existence of something beyond the material world. Something beyond what can be tested and verified and put into graphs. 
No one would believe that kind of thing is possible. And yet, in Ephesians chapter 6, as was read, we hear that there is something beyond what we can see, beyond what we can taste and touch and smell. Paul is convinced, Volunteer Park, that there is something more. And if you're joining us for the first time today, we are at the end of a series in the book of Ephesians. So we have been traveling through Ephesians, and because I had four teeth pulled last Thursday, yep, I love dentists now, and also uh, codeine, codeine, fantastic stuff. So we missed Ephesians 5, and we're going to 6. But we have learned together that the book of Ephesians was written by a follower of Jesus named Paul around AD 60. Paul was writing to the churches in Asia Minor and the church in Ephesus, because it was the largest, had this letter attributed to it. And so it's now called the letter to the Ephesians. And Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, and if you break down Ephesians into three parts, the first three chapters are all about God's actions, God's activities, God's words, what God is doing, what God has done through Christ for you, not what you have done. And when you read Ephesians, the, the, the writing of Paul is just soaring. It's high. The, the page leaps up with metaphors and similes about the lavish, lush, verdant, deep, cavernous grace of God. And then when you get to four, he transitions and says, now because God has done this for you, not because you have done anything, not because you're worthy, because God has done this for you and you're adopted you're chosen and you have citizenship in the kingdom of God as a response, live like this. And then Paul goes on to delineate moral and ethical reactions to the love of God. And now Paul is landing the plane in Ephesians 60. He's bringing this letter to a close. And it seems like a strange place to go to then start to speak about supernatural, spiritual forces in heavenly places. But it makes sense when you follow the trajectory because Paul is saying that in order to live a life like this, in response to the grace of God, you have to know that you will be opposed. You would not be able to live this freeing, lavish, incredible life that God calls you unopposed. And so Paul comes now in Ephesians chapter 6, and beginning in verse 10, as we read, he starts to tell us about the realm beyond the immediate. Paul starts to tell us that although this world seems so concrete, and so material, there are wrinkles, there are wrinkles in the fabric of the material world. And the wrinkles in the fabric intersect with our life and have a profound effect on us. And even when you look at the world today, you have people who are not Christian who believe in the existence of powers and of forces beyond what we can comprehend. For some people, it's looking at systemic evil. It's looking at structures that they think need to be corrected. And it's interesting. I will be going to Ephesians, but think with me for a moment. You have people like Bono, Bono, from U2, who in the 80s and the 90s, they started off with those concerts, right? And coming out with songs because they believed that people living in poverty, 
people who were disenfranchised, people who were unable to get three meals a day or clean water were actually living under the forces of systemic evil that needed to be corrected. And in, and in Seattle, you have people even on the extremely progressive side who champion courses, even this week, for example, rent control. In Washington, you cannot have rent control in cities, and it went to the legislature for them to overturn that so there could be rent control in Seattle and curb the homeless issue. People see that there is systemic wickedness and evil, and they fight against it. And so even if you look at it from that sense, there is something beyond what we can see that needs to be addressed. And for some of you, the very notion of uh, spiritual powers and wickedness in high places, it's not the kind of conversation you have in polite company. You don't go to dinner and bring up the wicked and supernatural powers that are happening. You know, people may uh, politely cough and, and cut their potatoes and continue eating it and pretend they didn't hear what you were saying. It's not something that postmodern people would believe. This is surely just a relic of an ancient book which is outdated and which has no uh, bearing on our life today. That is what some people may think when you start to enter this conversation. But I believe that Paul's conviction is true. And Seventh-day Adventists even call this uh, by uh, different names, a great controversy or a great controversy a cosmic conflict, a battle between good and evil. And here Paul is pulling back the curtains and he is saying, this is what is happening. Let me tell you, church in Ephesians, as you try to live a life based on God's grace, you are going to struggle. You are going to have a difficult time living up to the high calling of God in your life. And as a church, you need to know what is happening and the good news of what Jesus is doing in response. And so Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul begins by telling them about the other dimension. And he says in Ephesians Chapter 6, let's read that in uh, verse, yes, verse 10, thank you. <laughs> he says, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness up in the heavenly places. And then he gives you and gives us a way to deal with this. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of, of peace. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith which, with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Interesting. So Paul's answer to dealing with the spiritual wickedness that is in the world is to take on armor. Paul, why would we wear armor? Why would you choose this as the illustration for dealing 
with this realm that you are talking about. Scholars think that Paul in a Roman dungeon and is like any other prisoner, is probably chained to a Roman soldier. And so as he looks up at this Roman soldier, who he's been chained to, and is familiar with all of his habits and how he breathes and speaks, he sees the soldier clad in this armor, and he starts to describe the armor God is calling us to. Another interesting thing you find is that Paul is actually... Uh, referencing Isaiah chapter 59, verses 15 through, through to 17. That's right, Marilyn. Where God is pictured as a divine warrior coming to exact vengeance on behalf of Israel. And it's interesting because God is coming to exact vengeance on behalf of Israel because Israel has not been just. When you go to Isaiah 58, this is the passage which uh, talks about the Sabbath and not doing your own pleasure, which is fundamentally speaking about uh, the goodness of God in the context of uh, helping orphans and widows and doing justice. Paul takes this motif from Isaiah 50, 59, where God says, Israel, I'm mad at you. You know why I'm mad at you? Because you are not executing justice. You are not doing what I have called you to do. And so when he takes this motif, for me it's interesting because now I read uh, Ephesians chapter 6 in light of that, thinking there is a sense when Paul uh, speaks, he talks about righteousness. It's also another word that you can use for justice. Paul is telling us that as a church, taking on this armor of God, there is a sense in which we are being called to be God's agents against the systems of power, against the structures of evil in this world, and to speak well and clearly against it. Now, the line is not always clear, and I know some of you, I've spoken with you, have a history of marching, <laughs> You have a history of placards. You have a history of going to your, uh, your legislator, your appointed council member. And when you see wrong being done in your city or to certain groups of people, you recognize that there is something more behind the scene. There is a wrinkle in the fabric of the material world, and this ought not to be so. And so Paul calls them, and says, put on this armor so that you can withstand the day of evil. If you look in the Bible, you find that some people wore armor. You find that David was given the opportunity to wear Saul's armor, and it was too big, so he puts it down. You find David being able to penetrate Goliath's helmet with a stone. You find Ahab going into war wearing a full cloak of armor and an arrow finding a crack in the armor and killing him. And so as I read it, it's important for us to recognize that the armor that Paul is giving to us and telling us to put on is not a self-help plan. Sometimes this text gets distorted and minimized into a way to become spiritual champions on our own. So, for example, I had a friend who I, uh, uh, JJ, I went to school with her in England, and she went to, she went to a tradition where they were very much strong in prayer. And they would pray uh, strong prayers where they would bind and loose and command and uh, dictate. And, you know, they, they put themselves in the position based on Ephesians that they were able to go into the fracas of spiritual warfare 
and they could push and boss and subdue Satan on their own. And they would look at the armor as a way that if they were able to somehow manipulate it and have it on their persons, they were essentially invincible. It reminded me of another film, maybe from the 80s. No, this is the 90s. And this wasn't a film. <laughs> a show called... Um, oh, Power Rangers. There you go. Yeah, it's morphing time, right? So you have, they have the spandex suits, they have the red and the blue Power Rangers and, you know, something happens, there's a bad guy and the Power Rangers would have the ability <laughs> to have the supernatural power within themselves to be able to fight and to be victorious over their enemies. And if the enemy was uh, really big, then they would have their, um, oh, what's that thing? Thank you. What's it called? Right, so they would have that, and then if it was really bad, then they would come together and they would be like Megatron or something. Megatron. Megatrons, there you go, see? And sometimes Ephesians can be minimized, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, into being a sort of Power Ranger text for Christians, where we say, right, well, if I put on the breastplate of righteousness and the, and the sword and the helmet... I now have the ability to walk proudly through life and know that I can conquer everything. Now, I am in no way minimizing the power and the intensity of the fight or the complete victory Christ has given to us. But this is not a self-help plan. And that is why all the attributes that are given to us are not physical, even though they are represented by armor, they are internal characteristics. When you think about righteousness, when you think about faith, when you think about peace, when you think about truth, these are not tangible things and they are not things that you can practice every day and get better in. They are gifts that God gives to us. And in Romans chapter 13 verse 4, Paul speaking in a similar vein uh, speaks to the church in Rome and he says, you are going through a difficult time. And do you know what the solution is? You need to put on Christ. You need to put on Christ. And so this entire armor that we are supposed to have points us to putting on Jesus Christ. It points us not to ourself, not to what we do, but it points us back to what God has done what he has said, and what he will do through Christ in us, the message of Ephesians. And at the same time, I am so aware, even this week, of people who are struggling under the influence and the power of these forces that we cannot see but are extremely real. I was in my office maybe on Wednesday and I called someone for something. And as I called this person, he picked up the phone and he said, oh, I'm so glad you called. And he started to tell me about certain things that had been happening in his life. He, he lived a life that he now has rejected. Let's just put it that way. And he is struggling because at work, he has someone who all of a sudden, now that he is making a decision for Jesus Christ, and he is walking toward having a whole relationship with Christ, walking towards God's dream for him that he will have an abundant life, he starts to notice things happening. So someone is now just acting buck wild at his work. He's spoken to his boss and they don't seem to be able to figure out the situation. He's not sure what to do. All of a sudden, family members he hasn't spoken to for a very long time are calling him and telling him, oh, you want to make this decision. You want to increase and get closer to Christ. Well, you, he's never going to accept you. You're too far gone. He's gone to the stage now where he, he's having migraines each time he tries to concentrate on the word of God and tries to connect 
and to, and to be in a relationship with God. And he said to me, and I was so glad he said, he said, but you know what? It's okay. I understand that there is something more to this. I understand that there is a realm beyond what I can see and that Satan is not happy that I am taking these steps in my relationship with God. And so even as I'm reading this book and I'm reading about the principalities and the powers, and I know that it's just uh, not something you mention in polite conversation, in erudite, sophisticated, educated Seattleites would laugh at such a notion. I have spoken to people. Some of you have experienced it in your life or maybe experience it right now where you cannot put your finger on it, but you know and you feel and you can see that this is more than a coincidence. Things are happening in my life that are beyond my control. And if this hasn't happened to you, and you believe the Bible, and you believe the great controversy, Scripture makes it clear that Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Makes it clear that there was a war in heaven in Revelation 12 in which he was thrown to this earth and makes it his studied aim, his full-time, salaried, pensioned, great benefit plan to make your life a total misery. And this is real. And yet, as I read in Ephesians, and you read in chapter 6, uh, 10 through to 18, we start to get hope and advice from Paul. Paul says in chapter 10 and in, excuse me, in verse 10 and in 13, he says, when this is happening, stand. He says, stand. That's, that's like the strangest advice I've ever heard. You know, if you were in school and you got into a fight and you realized that you had just got into a fight with someone who was basically crazy and you made a huge mistake, you know, you would be trying to figure out a way to come out of that situation with some pride, you know. But then if you realize there is no way I can come out of this situation and still look cool, you know what the smart thing is to do? <laughs> you run. <laughs> you don't stand. You get out of there and you live to fight another day or dodge him another day and keep your lunch money, right? And yet Paul says, we are facing spiritual wickedness that is beyond our ability to be able to confront. And even after we've put on the armor of God and Romans 13, 15, it's uh, essentially putting on Christ. He says, then the next thing you do is you stand. Wow. Why, why are we standing, Paul? Why are we not charging into the fray or, or retreating to a safe distance? Why, why am I just standing? And I think Paul is telling us that we stand because on the cross, when Christ defeated Satan, Colossians tells us that he led him in a procession before the universe. And, it's, and it's, a, it's a notion that doesn't make sense unless you are familiar with Roman uh, military culture. Where if I come and defeat you, and I bring you back to my city, me, the general, General Andreas, has won a great victory for the empire of Rome. I would be on a chariot with two white horses, and I would have some of the people who I've conquered standing in the chariot behind me. And I would lead in procession the person that I have conquered in chains. And I would come down the main via of Rome. And there would be people on both sides cheering the victory that the god Mars, the Roman god of war, has given to me. And then they would come in a procession and they would be put to death in a coliseum before all of our people. And so Paul uses this imagery to say when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he reclaimed back from the grasp of these spiritual powers, these principalities. He took it back 
And now he leads Satan in a procession as a defeated foe. And so when he says, now put on all of these, put on this armor, Paul says, is letting us know the battle is real. He may have been defeated and mortally wounded, but he's not dead yet. And so he says, put on the whole armor, not just a piece of it, all of it. Put on the entire armor, put on Christ. And when you put on Christ, then you stand. And we stand because we are on territory that has been conquered and claimed and is possessed by Jesus Christ. And so we stand confident in his righteousness, in his power, in his salvation. And we stand knowing that he has already won on our behalf. And so as I'm reading this uh, chapter, Paul then brings uh, Ephesians chapter 6 to a close and he starts to speak about prayer. Pray, pray for me, you know, your bond servant in chains. Pray for each other, pray, pray, pray. And I'm sure I don't need to tell too many of you who are here today that even as we take on the armor of God and we stand in the victory that he has given us, that prayer, that prayer <laughs> makes a difference. I have seen in the past few months as I have spent time in prayer that it makes a difference. You have stories of when prayer made a difference. Some of you have been praying for people for 10, 20, 30 years. Don't stop. Prayer makes a difference. Some of you have uh, sent notes asking for prayer for families that have been blown apart because of decisions you made that cost you your family. We're praying for you. We believe prayer works. Some of you are dealing with situations that have no possible recourse in the material world, but we understand that there is another world, and in that world, prayer works. And even if you have nothing that you need to beg God for, know that prayer is also a spiritual discipline that helps to shape us and mold us into the people that Christ would want us to be. Some people even say prayer is not to get God to change or to do something, but it's to change us. Because God is always on our side. God is always dreaming and scheming ways to be on our side, to bless us, to extend his influence. And so when we pray, when we spend that rich quality time in prayer, if you can't wake up at 4.30 in the morning, it's all right. It doesn't make you unspiritual. You can pray other times. I'm, I'll say amen to that because I don't wake up at 4.30 in the morning. If I do, it's normally because, you know, a little human being has decided that they need to be awake at 4.30 in the morning and use me as a bouncy bed. So that, that for me does not constitute spiritual discipline. So if you are not waking up at 4.30 in the morning, that is all right. Find a time you can carve out and pray. Don't pray with fear, pray with confidence. Because even though this world is a battleground, Paul has told us that we stand confident in the victory that Jesus Christ has won for us. And so this morning, as I wrap up, I just want to encourage you I want to encourage you that if you have been praying and you have been struggling and you have been wrestling with some things in your life, that you will take the message of Ephesians as a whole to mind. You will recognize and believe and know that God has chosen you. God has adopted you. God has given you citizenship, citizenship in his kingdom. God has given you, uh, through Christ, a love whose dimensions cannot be measured. The breadth, the height, the width of a love that cannot be measured. And he calls you to live an incredible life. Not to win brownie points with him, 
but because you know he loves you. And he tells you today that if you are discouraged because things are falling apart at the seams, because life is not going how you thought it should go, that there is a way and that Christ has made himself available that we may put Jesus Christ on as our armor, that we can have confidence in what he has done, that we can stand resolute through prayer, knowing that Christ is in charge. So at this time, I, you know, I want to ask if you have something specific, something that you are praying with in this struggle, something that you know that is beyond your ability and you are incapable of making the transition and of being able to hold on to God, but you want prayer. I want to pray for you in a special way because I believe that even the things that this modern, postmodern world would see as completely ludicrous, that we know it's real. And we know that prayer has the ability to change our lives and our stories and our family members and our communities and this neighborhood. We're going to pray in a special way that Christ, who has already won the victory and leads in captivity those who are opposed to him, would do that in your life today. That Christ will open your eyes if you don't realize why certain things never seem to work out. Why certain uh, things seem to always occur in your family and you have no idea. Like, why is it that every second uncle is an ex? Why is every other aunt or cousin struggling with this? And without wanting to diminish science or psychology, we believe and we know that sometimes it's because there is more going on than meets the eye. And we want to take some time at this moment to pray for that. So I'm going to invite you to, to bow your heads. And just by a show of hands, if you would like a specific prayer based on Ephesians, that God will come into your life and will do something supernatural against the principalities, against the forces that are at war, just put your hand up. And I'm going to pray. Jesus in heaven, you see the hands that have gone up. And my hand is up also. We recognize that in this world, there is more to it than meets the eye. And in Ephesians, you have pulled back the curtains. And we see that there is a struggle, a cosmic conflict. And today, God, we are asking and we are pleading with you that you will come and you will wrestle and work on our behalf. God, I pray for family members today who are struggling and who are addicted and who are unable to break addictions. People who know that there are habits in their life that need to go. Not because you don't love them if the habits don't go, but because you want them to have an incredible freeing and expansive life. God, I pray for children who are lost, who are gone, who have no interest in you. God, we believe that even in these moments, there is a war and there is a struggle for their soul. And we ask that through Jesus Christ, you will reclaim them, that you will bring them back to your fold. God, we pray and I pray for that person here today who is struggling and who is begging for you to intercede and to come into their situation. It may be a difficult boss. It may be a relationship that is on a knife edge. God, come in and work your miracle working power. We believe that there is a struggle. We feel it. We see it. And we know it. And we want to ask today 
and proclaim that you have won that victory on the cross on our behalf. And we ask that we'll be able to stand in it. Be confident that you will be present. That we can leave this place today knowing that you are our strong warrior. You are our divine protector. And you will take care of all of these situations that we struggle with. And God, I also pray for our society, our neighborhood, for Capitol Hill and for, and for Seattle. You know the systemic and structural things that are damaging the lives of your children left, right, and center. And I pray that you will give us eyes to see, you will give us a heart to feel, and hands and feet to go and to be involved in pulling down those things so that people might be able to know you, whom to know is life eternal. We thank you so much, God, that we have victory in Jesus that we are a victorious people. We are not defeated because we have a king who although was crucified, rose on the third day, is resurrected and sits on high. And we have a hope that this world is going toward a place that one day you will put to right all the things in this world. We thank you for the victory that we have. In Jesus, amen.